We're going to talk about olive press today. Oop. Got to push the right button here. I did it again. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point and let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. We're entering into the Passover season this year, and in just a couple of weeks, the Christian world will be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Some of them, many of them, will recall the suffering of Jesus on that Friday just prior. But let's us, you and me, consider this morning for a few moments the events that preceded his arrest and crucifixion. I promise you this will not take a thoughtful hour this morning. There are many depictions of Christ praying in the garden, and many of them will look something like this one, where uh, they portray Jesus in a, in a calm and composed, rather pensive manner, uh, asking his Father to intercede for him. And this is only one of many, many such paintings. But I like to think that this 19th century woodcut portrays more accurately the utter anguish and consternation that confronted Jesus there in the garden as he's pleading with his father for relief. Relief from what? We're about to find out. So let's pray. Abba, Father, we're looking into things that are so intensely personal to you and your Son and your Spirit. And I pray as we do so that you would put your words into my mouth and that you would put your words into the ears of every one of us who will hear this message. We need to know what this time was all about and what it means to us. And so I pray for special grace just now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When Jesus departed the outer when Jesus departed the outer court of the temple for the last time. Uh, his thoughts had turned now toward the upper room, his last hours with his, with his closest friends, and to the evening that would follow. And we read in John 12 and verse 27, Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it... But for this cause, I came to this hour. Think about this for a moment. From age 12, Jesus had a clear sense of this cause for which he came from heaven. He was on a twofold mission. One, to redeem us, you and me, and the whole world from a certain destruction. And then two, to shine the light of truth on God's true character to a world that's been confined in darkness. So the creator that we know as Jesus literally stepped into his creation to become like one of us and embark on his mission. Consider what we're told about what Jesus knew before he left heavenly places. Again, it comes from the book Desire of Ages, a beautiful volume on the life of Christ. 
the work of Christ on earth was hastening to a close. Before him, in vivid outline, lay the scenes where his feet were tending. Even before he took humanity upon him, he saw the whole length of the path he must travel in order to save that which was lost. Every pang of his, that rent his heart, every insult that was heaped upon his head, every privation that he was called to endure was open to his view before he laid aside his crown and royal robe and stepped down from the throne to clothe his divinity with humanity. And so Jesus spent precious time with his closest friends in the upper room. They ate the last Passover meal that would have any validity, and then Jesus replaced it with the uh, simple supper of, of bread and wine that we know as the Lord's Supper. So he shared what truths he could with his friends while they were able to receive it. And then he told them this, John 14 and verse 30. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes, and he has nothing in me. Jesus, of course, is referring to his arch adversary, Satan. Notice he called Satan the prince of this world. Satan held dominion over a, a fallen race of humanity, and yet he had no hold upon Jesus. Now, how could that be? We're told one thing here in, in a book called My Life Today on page 323, and it reads, Christ is called the second Adam in purity and holiness, connected with God and beloved by God, he began where the first Adam began. Willingly, he passed over the ground where Adam fell and redeemed Adam's failure. And not only did Jesus redeem Adam's failure, but he redeemed the failures of all mankind, yours and mine included. Jesus left the upper room then with the 11. There, there were 12, but Judas had already taken off in a different direction. They made their way out of the city. They crossed the Kidron Valley to the east, and made their way to a favorite grove of olive trees on the Mount of Olives. And as they approached this garden called Gethsemane, a change started to come over Jesus. That name Gethsemane is an Aramaic name. Translated to English, it means olive press. We read about his experience in Matthew in chapter 26, beginning at verse 36. Then comes Jesus with them to a place called Gethsemane and says to the disciples, sit here while I go and, and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that'd be James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And then he says to them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even to death. Wait here and watch with me. What was happening to Jesus that brought on this sudden change? He was called the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Could it be his own reality that Jesus was quite literally taking upon his person the sin of the whole world? We have 
more insight, again from the book Desire of Ages, page 685. Now he seemed to be shut out from the light of God's sustaining presence. Now he was numbered with the transgressors. The guilt of the fallen humanity he must bear. And upon him who knew no sin must be laid the iniquity of us all. So dreadful does sin appear to him, so great is the weight of guilt that he must bear, that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his father's love. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God against transgression, he exclaims, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Incidentally, folks, I'm drawing from some other publications outside of the Bible, but may I reaffirm to you that this book is unique in all literature, that it has no equal, and that this is the greater light that we follow. There are other publications that we consider to be lesser lights that give us better clarity into what the greater light is, is telling us. They kind of fill in blanks from time to time. But it's, it's this book and this book alone that is our, our rule of faith and practice. Amen? So Jesus seemed to be shut out from the light of God's sustaining presence. Could it be that being shut out from God's sustaining presence is what the wrath of God is all about? We'll look into that a little bit later. The gospel prophet tells about this experience Jesus went through. Said, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, Father God, has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. A little later on, Isaiah uh, quotes God as saying, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you that he will not hear. Now this was foreign to Jesus. Father and son have throughout their entire existence, we have no way of knowing how far back that goes. But throughout their entire existence, they were in constant connection with each other. But now Jesus is our substitute for sin. And this experience of separation was new to them. It was unique. And it was distressing beyond ways for human language to describe. So I ask again, how are we to understand this reality of what Jesus was suffering? We can't rely upon science to, to tell us. Science couldn't, uh, can only observe natural phenomena. Science cannot observe supernatural phenomena. And, and that's what I believe Jesus was experiencing that, that evening. But it's, it's like the wind. No one can see the wind. You can feel it, uh, and you can tell where it's been. You can see the movement of the trees and see the effects of that. And, and so it's my sincere belief, friends, that that evening in the garden, as the weight of guilt was bearing upon Jesus, that 
the collective guilt of all mankind, yours and mine, every person, every age, traveled through space and time and converged on the person that we call the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It was a crushing weight. Jesus literally took our guilt, yours and mine. There was a part of us that was there that night. So do you hear what I'm saying? Jesus took our guilt. And if he took it, that means we don't have it anymore. Isn't that right? So let me repeat. Jesus took our guilt. We don't have it. And if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. The truth is, friends, if you will believe in your heart that Jesus took your guilt to the cross and died the death that you deserve to die, then he has set us free from that guilt and from that sentence. And this is the very essence of what justification by faith is. To be justified is to be set right before God. To be justified is to be just as if I'd never sinned. So is justification some kind of legal declaration that appears on a document somewhere that we, that we can't see and don't know where it is? No. Justification is a declaration of the reality of what happens when we open our heart's door to Jesus and to his abiding presence. It is the crossing over from death to life. And Paul explains it this way in his letter to the Romans, chapter 3, beginning at verse 23. He says, all have sinned. That's all of us. And we've come short of the glory of God. But being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation, that is, to provide settlement through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission or the forgiveness of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Those of you who have given your heart to Christ have, have known this experience that everything of your past God has, for, has forgiven and now we go forward with him. I well remember nearly 46 years ago now that when the Lord opened up my spiritual eyes and, and he introduced himself to me, something I'd always wanted to know, but then the spiritual person comes to life and, and you can perceive from spirit to spirit that Jesus is real. I didn't understand what was happening, what the process was. All I know is that some unseen burden had been lifted off my shoulders and, and I felt a freedom I'd never felt before. I hope you have that experience. And if you haven't given your life to Christ, do it. Ask him. Please come in and take my, my guilt away from me and, and enjoy the freedom that he gives you. <clears throat> but then what? We've accepted Jesus into our life He's taken our sin from us and its measure of guilt. So what do we do next? Well, he tell, tells us in this letter to the Colossians, chapter 2, 
beginning in verse 6. Paul says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So the admonition to us, every one of us, is leave behind this old life of slavery and walk in the newness of life of freedom with Jesus. And when we do this, there, there's never a time that we stumble and fall. Isn't that right? No. <laughs> we'll stumble and fall, perhaps many times. But we have this assurance. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So our walk with Jesus is a daily walk, sometimes stumbling, occasionally falling, but we get up, we don't turn back the other way to the old life, we keep walking with Jesus and the walk gets better and better as we go along. So what happens if you decide, well, that, that, that's not the life for me? What if there is no confession? What if there is no repentance? What if there is no remission from sin? Well, this is the inevitable result of that. Once more from the book Desire of Ages, page 223. The sinner's own thoughts are his accusers. And there can be no torture keener than the stings of a guilty conscience which give him no rest, day or night. Do you recognize a phrase there that you've seen before? No rest, day or night? Don't we see that in the third angel's message of Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11? I don't have it on the screen, but just listen. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man, anyone worship the beast and his image, receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. We have two choices in this life. We have justification by faith and freedom in the righteousness of Christ or we have the mark of the beast, slavery to sin, and no rest. Which one do you choose? So how does the wrath of God fit into all of this? Um, I'd like to suggest to you it's called the wrath of God because when Jesus died, for all the stored up wrath of humanity, he brought it with him when he went home to heaven. And he went home victorious, didn't he? Amen. Paul explains what wrath is all about in the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, chapter 2, verse 5. There he wrote, you're, After your hardness and impenitent heart, you treasure up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So Jesus took our wrath upon himself. 
he experienced what the unrepentant sinner will experience on the day of judgment. It's our wrath. It belongs to us. It doesn't belong to God. We're the ones that made it. He's just keeping it in store until that day of judgment when he comes to settle accounts, so to speak. So the best we can do is spend time with Jesus every day from the first part of the day. Spend time with him in his word. Spend time with him in conversation with him. Spend time with him in sharing his love with others. If there is a moment where you stumble and fall, take it to the Lord in confession. Don't give up on him. He's not giving up on you. Choose to repent. Choose to turn from the direction that led you into that sin. Turn to Jesus and don't ever forget that he bore all of your guilt including the guilt of sins that we haven't even yet thought about or committed. Just stay in connection with Jesus. He's the best friend that you and I could ever have. Now, back in the garden, the intense anguish that Jesus experienced could only be made worse by the taunting of Satan and his minions. You recall at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus spent 40 days in a wilderness, choosing not to eat until his father would provide for him, redeeming the failure of Adam and Eve in, in the lush garden home. But now, here at the end of his ministry, Jesus is uh, being taunted and tempted by Satan with the other side of the self-indulgence coin. It's the self-preservation coin. I can almost hear Satan taunting him. He said, telling him, you're the son of God. Why throw your life away? One of yours is going to betray you. Another one is going to deny you, and all the rest of them are going to desert you. You know, Jesus, if you die, you'll be mine forever. Why do that? Just save yourself. Again, from the book Desire of Ages, page 688. With the issues of the conflict before him, Christ's soul was filled with dread of separation from God. Satan told him that if he became surety for a sinful world, the separation would be eternal. He would be identified with Satan's kingdom and would never more be one with God. We can't begin to wrap our minds around how terrible this was for Jesus. Isaiah foretold, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. And so, Jesus prayed to his father. He said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus prayed this prayer three times. And this is the third time he prayed 
in Luke chapter 22. Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. There appeared an angel to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. This was not make-believe suffering, friends. The Son of God was seized with superhuman agony. And fainting and exhausted, he staggered back to the place of his former struggle. His suffering was even greater than before. As the agony of soul came upon him, his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Of the four gospel writers, wouldn't you know it's only Dr. Luke who makes note of this particular suffering of Jesus. What the scriptures describe is a medical condition that's called hematidrosis. It's something that occurs under times of extreme stress, such as what Jesus was called to endure. The physical and the emotional and spiritual distress was causing the rupturing of the tiny blood vessels that fed the sweat glands of Jesus. And what resulted is this mingling of blood and sweat and it tells us that the body of Jesus was virtually at the breaking point. The awful moment had come. The moment which was to decide the destiny of the world. The fate of humanity trembled in the balance. The woes and lamentations of a doomed world rise up before him. And he beholds its impending fate and his decision is made. He will save man at any cost to himself. And having made this decision, he literally fell dying to the ground from which he had partially risen. The Savior trod the winepress alone. And of the people, there was none with him. Jesus fell, dying to the ground? Is this some sort of hyperbole? Well, think back to this other garden, way back when things were much better than what we know. God had warned our sinless parents that if they were to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would surely die. The Hebrew of that verse looks something more like this. God told them, in the day you eat thereof, dying, you will die. Was this an arbitrary rule on God's part? Was God saying to our first parents, if you eat this fruit, I'll have to punish you with death for a piece of fruit? The principle goes much deeper than that, friends. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was God's way of asking Adam and Eve, do you trust me? They were sinless, yes, but they needed time to develop a relationship of trust. Adam and Eve fell short, as we all know. So perfection of character is perfection of a trust in God. 
So when they fell, God explained to them what the consequence of their fall would be. Genesis 3 and verse 19. Now, this is your life, your future. In the, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Another arbitrary made-up sentence for an arbitrary rule? Well, no. No, God, in these words here, has just described a law of physics that sin had invoked. Scientists call this law the law of entropy. And sin, it was sin that invoked this law. So what's entropy? It's a process of degradation, or it's a trend to disorder. And if you think about it, Sin separates us from God. Separation from the source of life invokes this law of entropy, and life begins to ebb away little by little, sometimes quicker than, than others. So denied the fruit of the tree of life, it took 930 years for Adam to exhaust the vital force that he had been created with. We live in a much different world today, but even back in Bible times, we're told that um, we might get 70 years, three score and 10. And then it says that if we're living real good, that maybe we'd get 80 or more years. But consider, put the burden of all humanity's guilt on the back of Jesus. And you can begin to see entropy that was kicking in at an insanely accelerated pace on the person of Jesus. There are some Christians who like to think that God punishes sinners. Isn't that right? And if God punishes sinners, by extension, God punished his own son who became our sin bearer. Isaiah talks about that notion back in chapter 53. Speaking of Jesus, he said, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And yet, notice, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. We can, in our minds, consider that God was punishing his own son. It's one of the most, uh, one of the oldest and the most repugnant lies that Satan has ever told. Here's the next verse. But... Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And it's with his stripes that we are healed. So then, how do you consider and how do you understand the demise of of the unrepentant. The Bible clearly tells us, choose, choose us this day who you will serve. Are we to believe in an eternal torment for someone who lived a good moral life of 70, 80 years, but otherwise had said no thanks to God? Is that a just sentence? That's another repugnant lie of Satan. So what is the reality? What happens to the unforgiven, the unrepentant? This is what a book called The, De the Great Controversy tells us, page 544. 
A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them, the unrepentant, that is, for heaven. Its purity, its holiness and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire, and they would long to flee from that holy place. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves. And it's just and merciful on the part of God. One last thing to consider. Where, oh where, was God there in the garden with his son going through everything he was called to endure? Last statement from the Desire of Ages, 694, and I hope you bear with me. I cannot read this passage without getting emotional about it. But God suffered with his son, was not lashing out punishment on him. He was suffering with him. Angels beheld the Savior's agony. They saw their Lord enclosed by legions of satanic forces. His nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. There was silence. In heaven, no harp was touched. Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as in silent grief they watched the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved Son? They would better understand how offensive in his sight is sin. How offensive in your sight, dear friend, is sin today. Every thought of self-interest, every word of self-interest, every action of self-interest, yours and mine, caused the suffering of Jesus. It's him or it's us. Which is it going to be? Jesus shed his blood in the garden. He could have died there. He should have died there. Had his people lifted him up as savior of the world, he would have died there. But they failed to live him up, lift him up, and so it was left to a pagan government to lift up the savior of the world on the, on the worst instrument of torture that man has ever invented. And so it's on the cross that we see the greatest demonstration of love that you and I will ever know. Oh, friends, lift up Jesus. Lift him up to your family. Lift him up to your friends. Lift him up to your loved ones. Lift him up to your neighbors. Lift him up in the workplace. Lift him up in the marketplace. Lift them up wherever you may be. Spend thoughtful time with him. Consider what his dying in your place means to you personally. Think about the life that he yearns to impart to you. Think about the restoration 
to your life that he has always intended to give you, a life that will bring you your greatest love, your greatest joy, your greatest peace. Jesus came to, li- to our human family to lift us up to his divine family. So lift them up to the world. In his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, right hand, are pleasures forevermore. Why would we want anything else? Why? Would you stand with me as we close with prayer? Lord Jesus, we can hardly wrap around our minds the glory of your character, the the height and depth and breadth of your love for us, your willingness to step in to your own creation, change the whole nature of your being and, and become our elder brother. And then taking upon yourself the guilt of all mankind and, and bearing its, its penalty, taking it from us, imparting your life to us. What an awesome God you are. Lord, we stand here witnessing to a watching universe that you are God Almighty, that we love you, that we trust you, and we live for the day that you will come and restore us and take us home to be with with your family. Thank you for what you have started in our lives. We trust that you will bring it to completion. In Jesus' name, amen.